Greetings, unsettled souls, and welcome to the Correct Views. Sam I Media Angie reporting for the Media Speaks. Now, how many of you are used to the uh, high def glossy look on the show? Low def, high def. Right about now, you're likely, uh, you're probably really confused. Well, don't be. The studio is being once again overhauled. We're working on getting the graphics back up. We're changing the background. And basically, the studio isn't up and running. So, I am doing the show exactly like this. How's that? And um, why? Because are you, are you really here to see a professionally lit version of my pretty face? Or do you want the news? Because if you want the news, I got the news. If you want me a my pretty face, we'll work on it. Steve Watson, Prison Planet. I want to get into all things Garland <clears throat> because... How do I want to word this? I don't like going over things that everybody else has already gone over. Um, for instance, um, when the Ferguson riots were going on. You heard it already. It's 4.30 in the morning Eastern Standard Time. I make my news so that when you wake up, you have all of the freshest commentary there is, regardless of what shift you work. Uh, it's been today for four and a half hours, so I mean, I'm first. I beat Rush. Um, I like to I like to give a moment for things to settle in, for the facts to be what they are, and then I like to go ahead and give you some commentary on it, and a few of these things regarding um, uh, Garland have stood out to me. Uh, so we're going to cover those in order. Let me know what you think. Um, I don't think there's going to be a lot here that I'm going to say that a lot of people are going to find offense to, unless, of course, you're a member of ISIS and you want to behead me. Um, in a remarkable, this is from Washington Post laments that Pamela Geller, who I call a hero, offers no apology after terrorists attacked her event. For those of you that don't know, um... Pamela Geller uh, was in charge of an event that encouraged people to draw Muslims, uh, excuse me, draw Mohammed, which is supposed to be this big taboo. Well, we'll get to this in a minute, but I don't remember people having a big taboo when someone put the crucifix, a picture of Christ, in a bottle of piss. I remember people sticking up for it. My personal thoughts, and again, there's more on this later. If you put a crucifix in a in a in a container of piss, you're a moron. You're just an idiot. You're not even gonna get a reaction out of me. Really, you're just an idiot. However, you should be free to do so because you're free to be an idiot. Well, it says in a remarkable piece published on its website last night, the Washington Post lamented the fact that Pamela Geller, the organizer behind the Texas Draw Mohammed cartoon contest, has not offered an apology in the wake of the terrorist attack, nor should she. Really, nor should she. Under the headline, and there's links on this, event organizer offers no apology after thwarted attack in Texas. Post writer Sanya Soma, I think that's Somesh Eshkar, wrote that Geller knew what she was doing when she staged the controversial event. Well, it doesn't matter whether she was trying to make people mad or not. She has the First Amendment right to make anybody mad that she wishes. And if you don't agree with that, you, then you're simply wrong, and we don't really care, because that's what the First Amendment is, move to another country. If the contest was intended as bait, it worked, this idiot continued in the piece, accusing Geller of being almost gleeful that she'd been right after she had said the event organizers were prepared for violence. The piece then details various accusations thrown toward Geller in the past by the Southern Poverty Law Center, accusing her of being an extremist and part of a hate group. Well, does anybody really care what the Southern Poverty Law Center really thinks? Because I know that I never have. Geller responded to her blog writing, I offer no apology. What apology exactly do I owe for almost being murdered? I, I like her. She speaks like I do. If you don't like me, you probably wouldn't like her. Um, it's unimaginable the descent of the mainstream media into this out-and-out pro-jihad agitation is complete, Geller, the president of the American Freedom Defense Initiative, added. 
Two Islamic jihadists attempt to murder hundreds of people at a free speech event in Texas, and the Washington Post says, I offer no apology, she urged her readers. Going on, it says, yes, I knew what I was doing. I was standing up for the freedom of speech in the teeth of violent intimidation. What the WOPO thinks I was doing, and that's another question, Geller stated. Thumbs up. She also had some choice words for SPLC. The Washington Post, true to form, doesn't explain why the far-left SPLC is an authority to which anyone of good faith should pay any attention. I agree. Who designated that radical left hate group as a legitimate authority? Geller wrote, The SPLC is not a neutral, impartial source. It's a far-left hate group that smears and deframes every group that deviates from its far-left line, Geller rightly concluded. The Twitterverse responded in usual fashion to the Post's shock and lack of apology to Geller. I stand behind Geller 150%. I really do. It doesn't matter if it offends you. It doesn't matter if it offends your religion. This is not a country that has respect for Sharia law, and we're not going to. How's that? People in the country may, but as a whole, no, it isn't happening. Eat it. Um, Savage on Garland shooting. There's a link between White House and ISIS. <clears throat> I, I've always really, really enjoyed Michael Savage. Now, I have to be honest, he's more socially conservative than I am. And that's why I'm a libertarian and he's a constitutional conservative. I, I don't share his odd belief with this notion that we need to keep everything in this box. It's, the society needs to, uh, for instance, I agree, I, I think uh, uh, the social norms, norms for who? You know what I mean? I, I don't have a problem with gay parades. If you join a gay parade, I think you're an idiot, because if there was a straight parade, I'd still think you were an idiot. But I don't have a problem with it like Savage does, those kinds of things. <clears throat> well, I agree with him on a lot of other things. For one thing, he's right on the Israel and a Palestinian debate more often than he's given credit for. And that is oftentimes where I don't always agree with uh, the liberty movement. Because they, see, they, they tend to side with anything that is anti-Israel. And they confuse Judaism with, with Zionism. Okay, Zionism obviously is a problem. You can look up the difference between the two. But that doesn't mean that I think that that land is not uh, Israel's. It's at least as much Israeli as it is Palestinian. Perhaps more. This is the New York Times. Uh, excuse me, I'm going to savage you. I got ahead of myself. The fact on the matter is, the FBI director James Carney warned us six weeks ago, this is from InfoWars, just before Hussein Obama's counterterrorism conference in Washington, where he invited Muslim groups, but disinvited Khomeini and ISIS in 49 out of 50 states, he stated Monday on the Alex Jones show. Why would he do that to the guy who warned us? There's only one answer. Someone on that team in the White House is playing for the other side. Don't agree with him? Okay. Then how do you think that happened? That's a legitimate question. Since we've been penetrated, we've been infiltrated, and how high it goes is anyone's guess. Savage also said, We know that the president's middle name is not Jesus. We know that the military has been told to stand down. We know that the police have been told to stand down. It says, uh, We also know that Obama ordered the Border Patrol to stand down from enforcing immigration laws, which practically opened the border for anyone, including ISIS, to enter the country with impunity. It doesn't matter, it says, whether it's drugs, bodies, or how large the group is, our agents are being ordered to stand down by Border Patrol Management. Sean Moran, Vice President of the National Border Council, told Breitbart in 2013, in case you think that Savage is lying. <clears throat> I have received reports from our agents in every single sector from San Diego to the Rio Grande Valley in Texas, and they are receiving these orders. Obama even told the Department of Homeland Security to slow down prosecution of illegals and may have even offered immigration and customs enforcement agents paid temporary leave from duty. So, I mean, there you go, friends. It's, 
it's something you would want to pay attention to because a lot of this, uh, two and two is not equaling four here by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, this is the story that I almost hopped to on accident. <coughs> this is from the Daily Caller, Alex Griswold. The New York Times loves blasphemy except when it targets Muslims. And I want to get into a lot of this because there's logic here. The other thing I want to say is you'll find that I speak about Christianity as if it was provable historical fact. That's because I believe, and I can prove to you, that Christianity is in fact a historical fact. How? Um, go to Amazon.com and look up a... Uh, I actually wrote it as a college term paper when I graduated. It's um, the historicity of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's called Risen. And uh, look up that name I just gave you, Risen, Historicity, blah, blah, blah. Samuel DeGange, that's me, and you'll find it. Um, I, don't know, I don't know what I'm charging for it. It's under five bucks. If you don't have five bucks, leave me a comment, and I'll make sure you get it. I'm asking you to buy it because I worked hard on it. All right, guys, uh, the New York Times editorial board tore into the newly murdered organizers of the Garland, Texas, Draw Mohammed event Wednesday, calling it hate speech and an exercise in bigotry and hatred posing as a blow for freedom. This is dated the 7th. Some of those who draw cartoons of the Prophet Muhammad may earnestly believe that they are striking a blow at freedom of expression, though it is hard to see how that goal is advanced by inflicting deliberate anguish on millions of devout Muslims who have nothing to do with terrorism. The time editorial reads, and it sounds fair-minded until we get into this article further. It says, as for the Garland event, <clears throat> they pretend that it was motivated by anything other than hate speech, and that's simply hogwash. Well, that's not true. That's, that's actually a lie. That statement is hogwash. It was to prove a point about the sanctity of the First Amendment. It's not shocking to see the Times taking a stance against inflicting deliberate anguish on millions of devout Muslims. Earlier this year, the Times pondered whether there were legitimate questions to be asked about whether there was a double standard in France allowing Charlie Hebdo to antagonize Muslims. <clears throat> Maybe Muslims just need to be a little bit less antagonizable. How about that? It says, obviously, there can be no but in condemning the murderous attack on Charlie Hebdo or the ideology that encourages murder in the name of religion. No, but they're going to add a yet. Not a but, but a yet. I don't know where their but is. Yet there are legitimate questions raised about freedom of expression in this tragedy. Now, it would have been but there are legitimate, so they did in fact add a but. They just have poor grammar. In the wake of the terror attack, it says French authorities began aggressively enforcements of law against supporting and justifying terrorism. Excuse me including arrests of people who spoke admiringly about the shootings at Charlie Hebdo. Not surprisingly, their actions have raised questions of a double standard, one for cartoonists who deliberately insult the religion, when their cartoons are certain to antagonize Muslims at a time when anti-Muslim feelings are already at high levels in France and across much of Europe and other of those who react by applauding terrorists. So it seems fair-minded, right? Well, let's go on with this article. He writes, and I've mentioned this earlier, but when Piss Christ, which was a photograph depicting a Christian crucifix submerged in urine, was created on a federal grant, that means your tax dollars, and exhibited at New York Stucks Galley, the Times really liked it. And they wrote, one of the few unattended benefits of the congressional outrage against <clears throat> Andres Serrano's scum is that he has brought widespread attention to a good artist. So it's okay to put Christ in piss, but it's not okay to put Mohammed in piss? Bullshit. His photographs are indeed provocative. Yeah, well, Christ never slept with a 12-year-old. They're also serious art. These religions emblem enveloped in dreamy golden haze without the title, or there would be no way of knowing the liquid it was, all that justifies it, suggest that arty images and mass production of religious souvenirs that have been partly responsible for the trivialization and exploitation of both religion and art. Not true. Not in the way he's saying it. It is possible to see <clears throat> Mr. Serrano, the scummy artiste, use of bodily fears as pure provocation. 
Well, yet yeah, what what Geller did wasn't pure was pure provocation, but this isn't. You notice that Geller, they said, deliberately baited the Muslims. Yet this guy is not just provocating Christians. No. Why? Because it's Christ. That's why. It says that uh, you can also believe that this was a form of purification. The fluids, because they don't want to say urine, make us look at the images harder and consider basic religious doctrine about the matter and spirit. So if you put a clay statue of Mohammed in a jar of urine, then those fluids will make you look at the image harder, right? New York Times. That's what they said. It's reading it to you. Unless, of course, is it just Christians? Is that what it is, you bigoted bastards? It says people may agree or disagree with him, <clears throat> or they may question his belief in photography. But you can... But how can anyone find that his work is just obscenely and disrespectful? Well, what if you did it to Muhammad then? What if you did it to Buddha? So it is hard to believe that anyone whose faith is searching and secure would not be grateful for what Mr. Serrano has done. Well, then fine, and I'm just as grateful for what Miss Geller has done. Eat it! This is going to be an angry show, I can already tell you. Likewise, when Piss Christ returned to New York in 99, the New York Times editorial board strongly defended its display in a public museum despite public outcry. A museum is obliged to challenge the public as well as to placate it. Well, good. Let's put Mohammed in a jar of piss. Let's put Buddha in a jar of piss. Let's see how that holds up. Because you stuck up for it when it was us, didn't you? And then, of course, it says when the Book of Mormon, not the, the play, not the book, was first arrived on the Broadway scene, the Times reviewed a musical that was explicitly intended to mock the faith of millions of Americans. One particular song is titled, in a made-up Ugandan language, F.U. God, containing the lyrics in English, F.U. God, in the ass, mouth, and C-U-N-T, the Times loved it. Now you should probably know that this collaboration between the creators of television South Park, Trey Parker and Matt Stone, and the composer Avenue Q, Robert Lopez, is also blasphemous, scurrilous, and more foul-mouthed than David Mamet on the Blue Streak. But trust me when I tell you that his heart is as pure as a Rodgers and Hammerstein show. Comparing that to Rodgers and Hammerstein is like comparing Kesha to Ludwig van Beethoven, for one thing. It says it brings us inevitably to the issue of sacrilege. Whether it, it's only sacrilege, you know, it's not sacrilege if it's done to Christians, only if it's done to Muslims. To hell with that. Yes, I said it. It says, this show makes specific use of the teachings of the Mormon Church, and especially the, ecclesi the ecclesiastical history from which the play takes its title. Church founders like Joseph Stalin and Brigham Young appear in illustrative sequences, as does Jesus and the angel named Maroni. When delivered in musical comedy style, these, vigilant, these vignettes float into the high altitudes of absurdity. So you can make fun of Christ, and when it's musical comedy, it's just absurdity. But yet, written comedy, which is a cartoon, does to Muslims, oh, 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 to hell with that, I don't have any respect for it at all. It says the major point in the Book of Mormon is that when looked at from a certain angle, all the forms of mythology and ritual that allow us to walk through the shadows of daily life and death are there on some level absurd. And that makes them both valiant and glorious. Well then, fine. And the major point of drawing Muhammad is that when looked at from a certain angle, all of the forms of mythology and ritual that allow us to walk through the shadows of daily life and death are the same thing. Eat it! And I'm no big supporter of Mormon because it's the most unfactual religion on the face of the planet. My point is, you make fun of everyone, and it's fine, but we're supposed to put Muslims on some certain level where, guess what? It isn't happening, and we're not going to capitulate to you. 
And it goes on to mention uh, when Death of Klinghoffer was an opera depicting the murder of a wheelchair-bound Jewish man. Uh, it was taken off, and the New York Times said that the play should have been allowed to go on. Again, proving that any time it's done to Christians, it's just fine to treat them any way they want. Well, it, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. I'm sorry, let's draw Mohammed. Absolutely ridiculous. And the last thing I'm going to get to on this, because I can't take anymore. I don't want to spend the whole show yelling. Comedians' insensitive comments about dead Dallas jihadists hailed as the best tweet in the history of Twitter. I do happen to believe, in fact, that this might just be the best and funniest tweet in the history of Twitter. Comedian Evan Sayet, who I was very happy that he did, in fact, say it, is getting a bit of blowback because of a tweet following the death of two terrorists in Garland, Texas. The attack on a cartoon event failed after a security guard killed the heavily armed individuals who were reportedly seeking revenge for insults against the Muslim prophet Mohammed, who we're all supposed to worship and bow down to, but aren't doing it, so certain factions of the Muslim religion are angry. I told you it was commentary. The event had offered a $10,000 prize for the winning cartoon. The guy that won got his uh, Facebook uh, page canceled and then actually happily got it back due to public outcry. Say it, a conservative decided to make light of the situation and tweeted what is being hailed by one user as the best tweet in the history of Twitter. And again, I think it is. He wrote, My favorite drawings at the Mohammed Cartoon Festival in Texas were the two chalk outlines out front. Booyah! Love it! Yes, absolutely true. The, the chalk outlines of the bastards that tried to kill the cartoonists. The comment has been retweeted over 2,500 times and is being reported on happily here with most users applauding it. Um, no, you can see the tweets on the site. Say it has no regret for the tweet. He says, I only regret that we live in a society where a joke at the expense of would-be mass murderers is something that anyone thinks I have to defend. And again, he writes, the leftists who accomplished their goal. Who is really irreverent here? Me, in a silly tweet about would-be mass murderers, or those who sought to assault that which should be revered, the First Amendment right, the human right to free speech. And I agree, we can make fun of Hitler, we should, and we will make fun of these little ISIS bastards as well. It says, in the interview, they're pigs, swines. With the Daily Caller, Sayet responded to what he calls newspeak and a culture of political correctness. Political correctness, which is just a euphemism for the totalitarian concept of newspeak written about in the Orwell in 1984, and make sure if you haven't read the book, you at least see the movie, has nearly destroyed comedy in the same way that it has nearly destroyed education, journalism, and the other fields where the powers that are on the left, Sayet told the DCNF. Now, just as the education system is used to indoctrinate children and journalism is used to the credence of to push leftist positions, comedy and the whole of entertainment industry is used to reinforce leftist propaganda. And I agree in every possible way. They used to make you read 1984. Now they make sure you don't because they don't want you to be awake, nor do they want you to be aware. Friends, you're listening to The Correct Views. Got more stories to get to. Going to get into some uh, like Baltimore insights. We got the most amazing science news and, of course, the uh, dumdy of the day. I just wanted to say real quick that this is brought to you by Sticker Junkie. Do you give like, maybe a rough idea of maybe what you kind of want your stickers to look like? Give that idea. Give that layout. Just write it out. Tell David Lake. Go ahead and get a hold of StickerJunkie.com and let them know that you heard about it from The Correct Views. Uh, put in the comment line, attention, David Lake. Let them know you heard about it from the correct views. You're going to get the best stickers you've ever imagined that you would ever get. And uh, you're going to get a discount because you mentioned that you heard about it on here. Uh, guys, we're going to go to this. This is from Zero Hedge. It's brought to you by Change Transportation. If you're within a 50-mile radius of Canton, Ohio, do make sure uh, before, before you get in the taxi, before you get into whatever is giving you that ride, Call change transportation with the price, and they'll price match it or beat it. Baltimore riots are <clears throat> stunning comments by Orioles owner's son, and uh, you can find change transportation transportation on Facebook. Shame on me. I this is interesting. Um, again, zero hedge. 
The day after violent protests left Baltimore burning, this is dated the 28th of April, in the wake of the funeral held for Freddie Gray, who died after sustaining a spinal injury while being taken into police custody, Americans are struggling to explain how the events that transpired on Monday evening are possible in modern-day America. While most are united in their condemnation of indiscriminate violence, many still feel the palatable sense of injustice after witnessing multiple instances of police misconduct. Blah, blah, blah. We know that. Well, this is from Orioles Executive Vice President John Angelos, son of Majority Owner Peter Angelos. Brett, speaking for myself, I agree with your point that the principle of peaceful, nonviolent protest and the observance, the observance of the rule of law is of utmost importance in our society. Emma K. Gandhi, Mandela, and all great opposition leaders throughout history have always preached this precept. Further, it is critical that in any democracy, investigation must be completed, and due process must be honored before any government or police members are judged responsible. That said... My greater source of personal concern, outrage, and sympathy beyond this particular case is focused neither upon one night's property damage nor upon the acts, but is focused rather upon the past four-decade period. Now listen to this, friends. Listen to this. That's why I'm reading this to you. The past four-decade period during which the American political elite has shipped middle-class and working jobs away from Baltimore in cities and towns around the U.S. to third world dictatorships like China and others plunged <clears throat> tens of millions of good hard-working Americans into economic devastation and then followed that action around the nation by diminishing every American civil rights protections in order to control an unfairly impoverished population under an ever-declining standard of living and suffering at the butt end of an ever more militarized and aggressive surveillance state. Let me pause for a second and let's analyze what he's saying because he has a point here. I mean, for those of you that say I don't do enough commentary, well, I'm glad you said that because I'm about to do something. And we'll, we'll finish this article in a minute, but let me say something here. That is a very important point. They have taken our good paying jobs, jobs that people in the, um, coming up from the maybe less than um, middle class neighborhoods, <clears throat> they would get a job in a, uh, in a factory on a low level position somewhere. And they would then get uh, raises and they would move up the ladder. And we all know the story. To save money, our country allowed the owners to move the jobs away from the country and into other nations that are paying slave wages, like a dollar a day, a bowl of rice, as Jello Biafra says, a dollar a day for people to do the jobs that they were making 15, 20 bucks an hour here to do. Don't give me the idea that this is free trade. This is not free trade. This is suicide. <clears throat> and I'll tell you why. Not all currencies are equal, and not all civil rights are equal. And libertarianism doesn't really work if things are stacked with a lot of bureaucracy and a lot of BS. Well, that's very much the case when you're dealing with outsourcing. Do you understand that? <clears throat> you can't pay somebody a dollar a day by taking the factories out of the country without creating dreadful ghettos in that country that lost those jobs. And in those ghettos grew, grew the kind of hatred that does not know color and does not know race, but it does know poverty, desperation, and uh, a lack of self-worth, which is what we all get, when, when, when we are in a position, when we do something day in, day out that we don't believe in, or that we can do, not, do nothing at all, because even that, that mund mundanality has been mailed, uh, sent out of the country. That's very important. He's saying that a lot of this is due to the greed that we let happen of outsourcing, and this can be reversed. You can. You can greatly, greatly penalize countries or companies that leave the country and do these sorts of things. There's a lots of other 
very uh, tangible solutions to this. And obviously, this has been a nightmare created by NAFTA and uh, Clinton, Bush, Obama. They've all they've all supported this. That has I just spelled out to you how it's destroyed entire cities and um, have devastated the middle class and ruined upward mobility. It's true. It's absolutely true. The innocent working families, he goes on, of all backgrounds, whose lives and dreams have been cut short by excessive violence, surveillance, and other abuses of the Bill of Rights by government, pay the true price, the ultimate price, and one that far exceeds the importance of any kids' games played tonight or ever at Camden Yards. Again, they got to remember that the animals were tearing up the city, so uh, they played a closed game, the only closed game in baseball history you know, the Orioles did. It says, we need to keep in mind people are suffering and dying around the U.S., and while we are thankful no one was injured at Camden Yards, there is a far bigger picture for poor Americans in Baltimore and everywhere who don't have jobs and who are losing economic, civil, and legal rights, and this makes inconvenience at a ball game irrelevant in light of the endless suffering government is afflicting upon ordinary Americans. Government is doing worse to us than... That is even imaginable. They, they, they are the ones who have mailed these jobs out. They are the ones who has allowed this to happen. They are NAFTA. They are outsourcing. They are the people that want a one-world currency. They are the mega banks. They are the central planners, friends. I can name names if you want. It says, not exactly what the U.S. Department of Truth wanted to hear. Yeah, I bet, because it was the truth. God bless that man. Now, listen to this. This is a Kurt Nemo InfoWars. Candidate Clinton blames Baltimore riots on income inequality. But Sam, isn't that what you just said? Well, yeah, but you have to remember the Clintons created income inequality as we know it today. It says a president wannabe, and hopefully won't be, Hillary Clinton toted the Democratic Party line on income inequality and race today in response to the Baltimore riots. Our goal, says Hillary, must be truly inclusive and lasting prosperity that's measured by how many families get ahead and stay ahead, Clinton said in a speech billed as the first major policy address of her presidential campaign. She finally came out for something. Remember, she got a standing ovation from a room full of journalists for not answering any questions, and you're going to tell me they're not playing the softball with this wretched woman? It says, how many children climb out of poverty and stay out of prison? How many young people go to college without breaking the bank? Well, I didn't, but that, that a lot of it was due to her and her family. Proposals suggested by Clinton include establishing policies designed to improve relations between black communities and police and reforming sentences for drug possession. Well, I look awful white, and... Uh, I'll probably never be able to pay off my student loans, so she's making it a racial issue. Why? It says it should be remembered that Hillary's husband, President Bill Clinton, was responsible for carrying the drug war torch initiated by his predecessors and creating the current situation that has benefited the prison industrial complex and led the way for the establishment of high-tech surveillance state. What does that mean? A lot of the people in inner city are dealing with this war on drugs as if it's not up to us what we put into our own body. If you harm somebody once you've put something into your own body, then that's a different ballgame. But this war on drugs has affected the black community and the poor community, regardless of color. It's Bill Clinton's policies that led to this, the Clinton family policies that have led to this. And now she is going to claim that it shouldn't be happening. Well, why don't you change, why don't you mention where these policies came from? Why don't you say you're going to end the war on drugs? Why? Other countries have done it, and when it's policed, it's a lot safer. It's never going to go away. I wish it would. It says, Clinton cravenly allowed federal, state, and local law enforcement to expand all of the tools left to him by Reagan and Bush. Peter Gorman and Bill Weinberg wrote in 01. In the Clinton years, police overreach in the name of the drug war shredded much of what remained of the Bill of Rights, and the most frequently caught in its web 
were not the drug kingpin legislators claimed to be going after, you know, the bigwigs. No, mothers, fathers, small-time dealers, medical marijuana users, and even children were caught in the criminal justice system. So overgrown, no one is immune to the new powers Johnny Law uses to protect us from ourselves. Again, what all they did was keep give prison records and uh, felony records to people that did nothing but sell some pot. And now they can't get a job and they're poor and their kids aren't. And this has all been caused by Clinton policies. It says, while much of the horror heaped upon the American public has occurred at the state and local levels, the tenor of the times begins at the top, which places the responsibility squarely at Bill Clinton's feet, the authors wrote. And they were right. It says the drug war emphasis is largely responsible for the current militarization of police and the subsequent ups versus them attitude of law enforcement. I can speak today. The militarization of American policing has occurred as a direct result of federal programs that use equipment transfers and funding to encourage aggressive enforcement of the war on drugs by state and local police agencies. It says Clinton did not address the delirious social and economic effects of the drug war. She did not mention the fact that her husband adopted and expanded the drug war. She did not talk about how this fact has imperiled the constitutional rights of Americans or how it has damaged the economy as states and federal government continue to waste billions on the ill-fated and misguided efforts. In 2014 alone, more than $51 billion was spent on the drug war. In 2012, 1.55 million people were arrested for non-violent drug charges. And of those, 749,825 people were arrested for marijuana. Oh my God, the end of the world, you smoke weed. Since 1980, 25.4 million Americans have been arrested on drug charges. And that number's a third of which are black. So who has done this to these largely 